Now I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to James chapter 5. And this morning we will complete our study of James by studying together verses 13 through 20. So turn with me to James chapter 5, beginning with verse 13, please. And one of the things that I've noticed is whenever James is taught, whether it's uh, here as a sermon series or it's taught as a Bible study, the common response that I receive from brothers and sisters in Christ is how much they enjoy the book of James because of its practicality. It's so down to earth. It deals with uh, just issues uh, that are just common to life. And that's true. Uh, The book of James is very practical, but it's also very severe, as uh, I hope you have come to see in our study, because in the letter of James, he confronts many sinful behaviors and attitudes in the lives of the people to whom he writes, his Jewish believers, his dear brothers and sisters who have been uh, driven out of Jerusalem uh, through violent persecution and are settled in towns and cities around the Mediterranean seaboard. And uh, he hits them he hits them pretty square with, uh, with uh, issues of sin in their lives as a church. Do you remember uh, verses 1 through 4 of chapter 4 as an example? He writes, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Those are strong terms. And if quarrels and fights and raw carnality existed here at Grace Community Church, we would not exist. You wouldn't put up with it. You wouldn't come to a church characterized by what we see in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 4. You wouldn't come to a church like that. We wouldn't exist. And see, when we stop and think about the letter, we see many ways in which the believers sin, not only against God, but against one another. With these knockdown, drag out fights, with the judgmentalism, with the problem that they had with their tongues, where they would argue in the meeting of the church and get angry with one another over the scriptures. Where they would practice judgmentalism, where they would elevate their personal convictions to a level of a divine law and then be judgmental and negative and critical towards those who didn't live up to their expectations. There are so many ways that they sinned against each other in these churches. It's an amazing thing that they even hung together as churches. And that's going to be very important as we look at our passage This morning, because as James brings his letter to a close, obviously he hopes that his readers will take to heart his instructions and his corrections. And we actually see the 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 closing of his letter begins in chapter seven, which we studied last week. And there he communicated his desire that as they're waiting for the Lord Jesus, that they be patient with one another, that they live with understanding and care for each other within the church family. Now, that's a tall order where undoubtedly there has been a tremendous amount of hurt in their relationships with each other in the church. But he's calling upon them to be patient with one another and not to grumble about each other but to care for one another, particularly in the midst of suffering as they wait for the return of the Lord Jesus. Now in verses 13 through 20, he is going to be admonishing them to care for one another. And so as we come, this is a fitting close to this letter where James has been concerned about 
the sanctification of his people and the ways in which they have drifted away from God and the way that they have sinned against one another. Now in 13, in verse 13 of chapter 5, James addressed his brothers and sisters who were suffering hardships. That is, they were suffering difficulties from outside of themselves. Essentially, he's referring to those who are suffering trials of various kinds. That brings us back to chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And he's saying, if you find yourself having fallen into a trial of various kinds, my counsel to you is to pray. That was his counsel in chapter 1, where he said, if you lack wisdom in the midst of your trial, ask God and he will give you wisdom. That is, if you ask with the settled conviction that you will do what he reveals. And certainly then their prayer would also include that God would strengthen them to remain faithful, steadfast in the midst of trials. And now in verse second half of verse 13, James addresses those brothers and sisters who are experiencing joy. Is anyone cheerful? Then let him sing praise. And so for those who are in a period of time where they are experiencing and enjoying the good and perfect gifts that come down from the Father of lights who does not change, he encourages them to lift songs of praise and worship and gratitude to their Heavenly Father. And then in verse 14, he addresses brothers and sisters who are sick. And we read in verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. It is important we understand the situation of these brothers and sisters whom James described as sick. James used two Greek words, astheneo and kamno. Both are translated sick in the ESV, but the English word sick does not convey the nuance of astheneo and kamno. From the complete word study dictionary of the New Testament, we learn that astheneo is from the noun asthenes, which means the noun means without strength, powerless, sick. So the verb form astheneo means to lack strength, to be infirm, weak, feeble. Now, Camno, again, from the same complete word study dictionary of the New Testament, Camno, we discover, means primarily to work, to be weary from constant work. And then when used in conjunction with astheneo, to be sick, Camno suggests the common accompaniment of sickness. That is, Camno is the idea of weariness of mind, which may hinder physical recovery. Weariness of mind that may hinder physical recovery. And so the emphasis of astheneo and kamno is weariness of body and mind. Weariness of body and mind. And so James seems to be addressing those believers in his churches who were sick in the sense that they were beaten down. They were ground down by the difficulties of their lives. They were so worn out and so low, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, that they found it difficult, if not impossible, even to pray. Now remember these dear folks, their life situations. Remember, unlike us, they had suffered violent persecution and were driven from their homes and livelihoods in Jerusalem. We have no idea what that would be like and the stress and fear that that would produce in us. But they have survived that. They have settled in towns and cities around the Mediterranean seaboard. But many of them are still poor. And so they struggle on a daily basis to secure enough food to eat and to keep enough clothing to be clothed against the elements, perhaps even to find shelter. And then some of them are being abused by their fellow Christians. 
As we see in in chapters 2 and in chapters 5, some of them are being taken to court by their rich Christian brothers and sisters. Others who are working for their Christian brothers and sisters are being abused in that they're not receiving their wages. And then the church itself is not a place of solace. Because when they go to the meeting of the church, what happens there? The meeting erupts in angry debate about the teaching of the word, whether they agree with the teacher or they don't agree with the teacher. And then there's judgmentalism in the church, as we already talked about. There's slander, speaking about each other behind each other's backs. How uncomfortable it is, is it to be in the church with the rich brother or sister who is abusing you? The church was no place of solace and peace for some of them. And then they were without hope because as they looked out and they looked at their lives, it didn't look like anything was going to change until they died. And so as I will demonstrate in a moment, these brothers or sisters are having a crisis of faith. That seems to be at the heart of their sickness. And folks, without faith in the midst of those kind of crushing difficulties, what rushes in and takes hold of our hearts and minds? Anxiety? Stress? Fear? Anger? Bitterness? Depression? That's what's making these people sick is as their faith is weakened and they're crushed by the difficulties of life, they are experiencing the effects of stress and anxiety on their hearts, minds, their bodies, their emotions, their spirits. Now let me ask you this, what does stress and anxiety do to our bodies? Well, From the dictionary or for the Encyclopedia of Stress, 2007, we learn stress related disorder is defined as an increased stress load or reduced ability to adapt that depletes the reserve capacity of individuals, increasing their vulnerability to health problems. From the same article, excessive stress sometimes manifests as cardiovascular problems, including hypertension. As digestive difficulties, including heartburn, ulcer, bowel syndromes. Respiratory illness and susceptibility to bacterial and viral illness. Endocrine dysfunction, particularly adrenal or thyroid dysfunction. And delayed or reduced cellular repair. Sleep disorders and breathing pattern disorders, just to mention a few conditions. The sick believer in verse 14 seems to be a believer so beaten down by the difficulties of life and so weakened in faith, they were suffering stress-related disorders. They needed help. They needed the loving care of their shepherds. That is the counsel that James gives to those who find themselves sick with worry, sick with doubt, sick even possibly, as we will see in a moment, from unconfessed sin. And so James' counsel to the sick is, anyone sick among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. The sick brother or sister was to request that the elders come to their bedside. So this was no office appointment. This was the elders coming to the home of a beloved brother or sister who was so crushed that they are in need of the ministry of the elders. And the elders were to come and to listen to their story and to empathize with their pain. And they were to take the olive oil and it was nothing, it was nothing mystical or rigid. It was therapeutic. And so they were to rub, 
rubbed uh, uh, stiff shoulders and, and, and sore muscles, and they were to bring physical comfort as they were able to the sick one. And they were to take the sick one to the word and encourage them to turn their eyes to the Lord and to be encouraged once again to put their faith in him. They were to give counsel where counsel was appropriate. They were to look for ways to help solve the believer's problems and let them know that they were not alone, but they had a church family that would come and help them and minister to their practical needs. They were to encourage them to trust the Lord and they were to, then they were to pray for them. And James anticipated that the ministry of the elders would lead to two possible responses from the one who is sick. The first is a vow of faith and the second is a confession of unconfessed sin. Verse 15 reads, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. The word translated prayer in the phrase prayer of faith is different than the word for prayer that is used in verse 14. In this context, it should more accurately be translated vow. In other words, verse 15 should read, and the vow of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And to be clear, the vow of faith is coming from the sick brother or sister in response to the ministry of the elders, the ministry of the word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It is the sick individual who is making the vow of faith. And we'll explain that in just a moment. Now. We find support for this translation in the complete word study dictionary that I've already referred to. There we read that euxe, which is the term translated prayer in verse 15, the prayer of faith. Euxe is from euxomai, which means to wish, pray, or vow. And so, UK is a noun referring to prayer or wish. Now, it says in James 5.15, it is translated prayer because in verse 14, the compound verb prosuch amai, to pray, is used. If, however, prayer was meant by UK, the more common word prosuke would have been used. And so the complete word study dictionary of the New Testament is arguing that UK, prayer of faith, is not the correct translation. Okay? It is arguing that the basic meaning of UK is wish or vow. And here should be translated, in our opinion, vow. The vow of faith will save the one who is sick. So that verse 15 should read, And the vow of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. The vow of faith was a recommitment was a renewal of the sick individual's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not for salvation, but for living. To get them through the difficulties that have crushed them. And so as the ministry of the elders, the word, the spirit, impacts the sick brother or sister... They are moved to renew their faith that has been crushed by anxiety and fear. To renew their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to look up and to trust that God is good. That God does have the power to meet their needs. And so they make a vow of faith in the sense that they recommit themselves to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. 
by faith. And that then will set them free from what? Anxiety, stress, fear, depression, anger, bitterness. These things that are, that are making them sick, the source will be resolved as they trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, they are renewed in their relationship with them and they are set free from the effects of stress and anxiety and fear. And the second possible response is if they are so moved, they will confess unconfessed sin that may also be contributing to their sickness. And in this, then, the ministry of the, the elders will be to help set free this brother or sister from the effects of stress and of sin and restore them to a living relationship with Jesus Christ once again. And the Lord will raise him up. Now, what's interesting is in verse 16, James draws an application from verses 14 and 15. Whatever was happening in verses, in verses 14 and 15 has to be reflected in verse 16. Because James starts this verse with what word? And you can say it out loud. We can, we can speak to one another here at Grace. He starts with what important word? Therefore, so he's drawing a conclusion. He's drawing an application. And that application is obviously based on the elder's ministry to the sick person. So the elements that are in 16 have to be in verses 14 and 15. Have to reflect what was taking place in the ministry of the elders to the sick. So he draws this conclusion. Confess your sins to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Now stop and think with me again how profound this verse is. To a people who have sinned egregiously against one another in their churches. Remember they've had a terrible time with their tongues. And he says, with your tongue, you praise God, and then you curse men who are created in his image. They have a problem with grumbling about one another in their churches. They have a problem with slandering one another in their churches. They show favoritism to the rich, and they embarrass and shame the poor brothers and sisters in their churches by telling them to go sit over there in the corner. They have these... Drag out, knock down fights and quarrels because of their carnal passions that they're trying to fulfill. And so when he talks about them confessing their sins to one another, that would be a massive step for these people to take in their relationships with each other. But see, that is the only way towards healing in their individual lives and in their corporate lives as a church is to remove that which is destroying their relationships of love and care for one another. That's working directly against their ability to be patient with one another and live with understanding and care as they wait for the Lord Jesus Christ. The only path is through confession and forgiveness of one another in the ways that they have sinned against each other. And this is what he admonishes them to do. And if they will do it, what is the promise? That you may be healed. Now the term healed there means can mean healed from sickness. And I would again argue that it's a sickness that is, comes from stress-related disorders. It can also mean to be healed from the consequences of sin. And I believe that's the focus for James. That if they will confess to one another their sins and obviously then forgive one another for the way they have, they have been sinned against, it will lead to healing in their churches. And they'll be healed relationally. 
They'll be healed as a church family and once again begin to experience unity, begin to rebuild trust with one another. There will be peace and they will be able to bring true comfort and encouragement to one another because life is so difficult anyway that you want to have a church family that is a place of solace, that is a place of comfort, that is a place of love, that is a place of peace. That is a safe place in a dangerous, difficult world. And this is what he is calling his people to. So we believe this passage is teaching believers to love and to care for one another by confessing their sins to one another and praying for one another. And that this will lead to healing in their individual and corporate lives as a church family, from the destructive consequences of the ways that they have been sinning against each other. Now, James used Elijah as an example of the power of a righteous person's prayer in verses 17 through 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Now this is obviously an encouragement. Elijah's example should encourage us to pray. and To know that God responds to the prayers of a righteous man or woman. Now many people have taken this to mean that, he, that this is an encouragement to pray the prayer of faith so that you can get healed. And that Elijah is that example, that you can have that kind of power. We suggest that something else is in mind here. Because if if James's focus in this section is on how to get a healing, and that if you have enough faith, you can get healed, if if that's his focus, then would he not have drawn from James or Elijah's experience where through prayer He was used to restore the widow's son to life. Would that not have been the illustration you would use if you want to emphasize that you can pray the prayer of faith and if you have enough faith, you can get your physical healing. He would have chosen that event from Elijah's life. But this event from Elijah's life has to do with divine punishment of sin and restoration. Elijah prayed And for three and a half years, God in divine punishment of the nation of Israel withheld rain. And you know how devastating that is to an agrarian society. And then Elijah prayed again and God released the rains. And the earth then once again produced its fruit. And so here, the prayer of Elijah is for divine punishment of sin and then for restoration from sin. And that's in line with his admonition in verse 16. To confess your sin, to get free from your sin, forgive one another, be restored, be healed. And then it's in line with the way that James so masterfully and so simply ends his letter that I was stunned. When it occurred to me what he was doing. Notice verses 19 through 20. Which has to do with restoring a brother who has wandered away. A sister who has wandered away. To restoring them to a right relationship with God. He says, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth. And someone brings him back. Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Do you see how this is sin and then the restoration from sin? It's consistent with the example of Elijah, what he prayed for. It's consistent with 13 through 18. And you see, restoring a brother or sister who has wandered away from the faith 
Restoring them is the epitome of makrothumeo. It's the epitome of treating one another with patience and care and understanding while we wait for the Lord Jesus. It's the epitome of caring for one another in 13 through 18, where we stand ready to forgive, to confess our sins, to forgive, to restore, to, to bring back into fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ and with his people. It's all of a piece. And we see this here then in his final two verses. And before I give you my final thoughts on it, I need to answer this question that is a legitimate question for many of us. And that is when he says that the person who restores will, uh, this sinner will save his soul from death. And many times the instant thought is save Save always means go to heaven when you die. Death always means the lake of fire, ultimate damnation. We've learned that that's not true, correct? And so the term here, save, means to deliver from, to rescue. And then it says his soul. Well, how is he using his soul here? Well, he's using his soul here exactly the way he used the term souls in chapter 1, verse 21. Now, in chapter 1, verse 21, we read, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Same phrase. But here, their souls means their life in this life, in the here and now, in, in the here and then. Right then. And from what in the context do they need to be delivered? From what do they need to be rescued? From what do they need to be saved in verse 21 of chapter 1? It's right there. What are, still, what are some of them still practicing as professing believers of Jesus Christ? What does he say? We can talk to one another. We really can. Not like Pentecostal, you know, wow. But anyway... What does it say in the first part of the sentence? Therefore, put away all. What do they need to be saved from? Filthiness and rampant wickedness. And how will they get saved from filthiness and rampant wickedness? By receiving the word of God in the sense of hearing it and obeying it rather than arguing about it. So this has to do with their present life. As also it does in verse 20 of chapter 5. The one who is brought back, who renews their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. James is encouraging the brother or sister who has a part in that process. That you are helping save that brother or sister in this life, in the here and now, from death. Now, what does he mean by death? It can mean one of two things. It can mean separation from God's kingdom life now. Or it can mean divine punishment in the form of a premature physical death. Because we know in the scriptures that God will discipline his children. And he will use premature physical death to discipline them. We have the example of Ananias and Sapphira. We have the example of the believers in Corinth who were uh, inappropriate at the Lord's Supper. And the Apostle Paul said, for this reason, some of you are sick and some of you have fallen asleep, which is a euphemism for death. They have been taken by their loving Heavenly Father in discipline. And so... James is encouraging those who will care and be patient with brothers and sisters who will wander away, who will go after them and pursue them and be used of the Lord to restore them to a right relationship with God. And he encourages them to say, when you do that, do you realize that you are saving their soul from death? That's a good thing. That is a wonderful thing. That's what I'm after. 
And what struck me is that 19 and 20 of James 5, 19 and 20 that we're talking about is the summation of his entire letter. Because when we seriously look at the condition of these people, as I've gone over and over again this morning, the problems with their tongue, their needing to be saved from filthiness and rampant wickedness, their favoritism, they're wandering away into a heretical belief that you can have faith without works. Okay? The struggle with their tongues. Their carnality that he calls them an adulterous people and says friendship with the world is enmity with God. They are enemies of God. These people are not well spiritually to whom he is writing. These are people who have wandered away from the truth. These are churches who have wandered away from the truth. And what is James seeking to do through his letter? Is to bring them back. To restore them. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, this is what James is attempting to do through his letter. With all of his beloved brethren in these churches whom he loves so much, but who have wandered. He is seeking to restore them and to do and accomplish exactly what he says in verses 19 and 20 of chapter 5. This is the heart of a pastor who loves his people and he's so concerned for them that they come back to a right relationship with Jesus. I hope that we will be a people, a church, who loves one another so much that we'll go after the wandering. That we'll love each other so much that we will be patient, understanding, caring, confessing our sins to one another, forgiving one another, praying for one another as we wait for the Lord Jesus and as suffering increases in the days to come. May James have a lasting impact on us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I do pray that we will learn the lessons of James. That we will check ourselves and see if we are guilty of any of the sins that James confronts with his beloved brethren and that we would take the way of restoration, that we'd, we would confess our sins, we would agree with you, that we would repent, we would do the, the works of repentance and that we would then pick up and be restored in our relationship with you. And if we have sinned against one another, that we would humble ourselves and go to one another and love each other enough and value each other enough and be sensitive to one another enough that we will confess our sin when we are guilty. And then we will, we will render forgiveness to one another that we might be healed. And that Grace Church would be a place of solace and comfort and encouragement and love as we are all in the process of sanctification. As we face increasingly the rejection of our own culture and suffering becomes more acute. Prepare us. Prepare us to persevere and to be steadfast in faith until the Lord Jesus comes and takes us home. I pray this in his name. Amen.